Good morning. Welcome to Greenwood Baptist Church. It's Palm Sunday, and we are thrilled to be here. I'm glad that you're there to worship with us, so join us as we sing. reading from Psalms 96, starting in verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. <clears throat> yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. 
Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Father, we love you and thank you for a day that you've given us. God, we thank you for what this week represents. And as we look forward to, to Easter, Father, your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Father, I pray that you would help us to be in a mindset this week of worship and adoration of who you are. Help us right now as we worship you, as we praise you. Father, you are great among everything. Yes. Greater than any idol we could create. So, Father, we seek to love and adore you. And though we fail you, Father, we thank you for your forgiveness and for drawing us to repentance. And I pray, God, that all of us here tonight, this morning, God, wherever they are watching this, that this would be a time of worship yes. and drawing people to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Dream. 
Good morning. I am glad to be here today. You know, I made a promise to myself this week. I said for the first two Sundays that we've done this, I came on and I said, well, this is the first time we've ever been live stream. And I told you how nervous I was and I told you how uncomfortable I was. And then last week I said, I'm still not used to this. So I made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to talk about it being week three of us being live streamed instead of together in worship. But I think I just did, so I guess I blew that out of the water this morning. But I want to tell you, this week I've had a chance to do a whole lot of reaching out by text and phone calls to a lot of the church members. And if you hadn't heard from me, hold on, I'm coming. I'm working my way through this. I'm going down the list. I'm, I'm calling people as I think about them or if I see something that reminds me of them. So I'm trying my best to reach out to everybody. Some of you I don't have a number for. And you know, it's okay for you to reach out to me too, especially if you think I might not have your number. Send me your digits and I'll respond. I'll be glad to respond. I, uh, this week, I was accused of maybe preaching in short pants. Somebody told me this week, said, Pastor, you never came out from behind the pulpit. We believe you had on short britches. But that wasn't true. I had on long pants. I, I have dressed, my dress code is even a little more relaxed than it has been, but not shorts. <laughs> not yet, anyway. <laughs> if, we get to, if we have to preach without air conditioning, you might see me in short pants. But until then, we're going to keep on preaching. We're going to keep on trusting. And we're going to keep on doing what we've been doing. I want to encourage you again this morning to continue to reach out to each other. If you're a Sunday school teacher, reach out to your class. If you're a Sunday school member, reach out to your other class members. Reach out to people that crosses your mind and be in constant prayer for all of our church family and the families of those in our community and in our state and in our country, even in the world. Please continue to pray for these people. Today is Palm Sunday, and our title of our sermon today is About His Father's Business. I've been reading all week about what Jesus was doing leading up to this week, the last week of his earthly ministry. I've been reading how he was acting and what he was doing and how he carried on. And it's been very good for me. It's been very impressive. To, I've been impressed by what Jesus was doing. And so today, that's kind of what we're going to share. This was an important week in the life of Jesus. He was finishing up three years of his earthly ministry. I want you to know that his intentions was clear the whole time he was here. And I want to start out today, this is not our text, but I want to start out today by reading you something in Matthew chapter 4. I think it's verses 1 through 11. That's right, verses 1 through 11. And this is Jesus tested in the wilderness. I want you to hear this this morning. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus, an Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil then took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If, you're the son, if you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike a foot against, your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. I started out by this today, started out by reading this today, but because I want you to see that God's intention, this was in Matthew chapter 4, early in his ministry, Jesus' 
intentions were to serve his father. This did not change for him throughout his ministry. His intentions was to do what the father called him to do and commanded him to do. He told the devil that bread, although important to our physical being, is not what we live by. We live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Today we get the word of God, the words from God from the Bible, the word of God. He told the devil not to tempt him with scripture. The devil even tried to use scripture against Jesus and saying it's written that the angels will catch you. They won't let you bruise even your foot, the heel of your foot. Throw yourself off this high, high temple and the angels won't let you be harmed. And he said, don't test God. Don't test God in what you're doing. Listen, that's a good word for us today. We need to trust God, but not test God. We need to rely on God's promises in these times, but not test God. Jesus said, don't put God to the test. Honor him. And then third, he tempted him with riches. And he said, if you would just yield, if you would just bow down before me. And Jesus plainly tells Satan, be gone. And he tells him, I only worship the true living God, and I'm here to serve him. And church, that's where we are. That's what we should do. These times are troubling, but listen, this ain't the first trouble in our world, and it won't be the last. This is a big thing. This, is, this covers the world, but there's trouble all the time. And we have to make a choice every day whether we'll follow Jesus or not. And that's simple. I want to show you today in these words. I want to show you today in these words that Jesus sets a standard. He sets a standard on how he will live and what he will do. Today, we're going to look at what Jesus did in this week. And we're going to start out with our scripture verse, our, our text, which is Luke. Let me see. I've kind of lost my place here. Luke. I'm sorry. Luke 35. Luke 18, 35 through 43. I'm going to read that to us now. And this is, this in my Bible it says, and I'm reading, I'm reading out of the NIV, it says, a blind beggar receives his sight. And this is verse 35, chapter 18 of Luke, verse 35 through 43. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and he ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, to Je when he came near Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God when all the people saw it. They also praised God. And that's our text today. And I want you to see a few things here as we start out this morning. And then after we go over this just for a second, we might come back to it as we go. But as we go, after we go over this, we're going to name some other things that Jesus did during this time. So he has this encounter. The first thing that reaches out to me, and, and, I, and I just, I'm stopped by every time I read this. It says he was blind and he was begging. So he was sitting there. He was, he was at the mercy of whoever passed by. He was sitting there, and if somebody chose to reach into their pocket and hand him some money, he took it. If somebody chose to hand him food, he took it. He couldn't tell if they were coming or going. He couldn't see them. He had his other senses. He could hear. He could feel what was going on around, but he didn't know. He was totally sitting there. He was wide open to whatever anybody decided to do to him. And I've preached this before. I've preached this before standing right here. But for me today, this takes on a new meaning. He was standing there vulnerable, open up to the world, whatever, can't control what's going to happen. The world is passing me by. 
We're sitting here in a time in our life where we don't know if we encounter somebody at the grocery store, if we get too close, are they carrying this virus? Are we a carrier? We are sitting here in an unprecedented time in our life. We don't know if what's going to happen next, really. And it can grip us with fear. And I thought about how this blind guy must be and how he must feel every day somebody leads him by his hand and they place him here. Every day he has to count that somebody's coming to get him and take him back. Every day he's got to know that somebody else has to be his eyes. And we're sitting here wondering, is somebody in my family going to get sick? Is somebody in my church going to get sick? Have I sat by somebody recently who is already sick? And we are at a place in time where we have to say we're going to trust. And so this blind man had obviously, he had ears, and he had heard the story of Jesus Christ. He had heard who Jesus was. He had heard what Jesus has done. And when Jesus came by, he started calling out to him. He called on the name of Jesus. And you say, well, gosh, Pastor, that makes sense. He's blind. He's suffering. He hears about this guy. He knows what he's doing. But listen, it's got significance. He called on the name of Jesus. And what did they tell him to do? Don't do it. Don't call out. Don't bother Jesus. Jesus is busy. Do you ever feel that way? Do you feel sometimes when you show your love for Christ, somebody tries to rep- repress it and push it down? Do you feel like when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray now in these times, people are saying, well, what are you doing? Why are you praying to God? Why would a good God let any of this happen anyway? Listen, this world is evil and this world is messed up and this world is going to be messed up. It's going to stay messed up until Jesus Christ comes back. But this guy had the right idea. He, they told him to stop. He cried even more. And then this, is, this picture is painted here. He is sitting there helpless, blind, begging on the street. And Jesus stops the whole entourage. I can't imagine how many people were following Jesus from place to place when Jesus was doing all the things he was doing. And so this whole thing, these disciples are walking the way, clearing the way, coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And this guy is shouting, help me, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops to hear this one individual. Now, you know, that crowd could have rushed right on by, and they could have gone on to do bigger and better things. But Jesus stopped for this one person. Do you pick, are you picking up what I'm putting down today? Jesus stopped to take care of the needs of one person. Do you see the importance Jesus placed on this man? And he loves us just as much. Do you see that today? He loves us just as much. He, put an, he had enough love for this beggar, this blind beggar to stop. And then I love this. He asked him, what do you want from me? And man, this man was brutally honest. This man went straight for the big money. He said, Jesus, I want to see. I want my eyes open. I want to see. And I feel like today that some of us are still walking around with spiritual blinders on. I feel like today that some of us are still walking around with spiritual blinders on and we don't even see what is happening in this world and in our world and the opportunity that this gives us as people of faith. We don't even see it. And this guy simply said, Lord, you want to know what I want? I want you to open my eyes. You want to know what I want? I want to receive my sight. I want to walk myself home today. I want to go to the market and buy my own groceries. I want to take care of my family. I want to be able to see. And Jesus said a simple response. Your faith has healed you today. See, a small act, maybe in this man's life at this point, it was not a small act. He was crying out for mercy. He probably didn't even understand all the things about Jesus, but he heard about Jesus and he knew about Jesus and his faith, his little bit of faith, his faith extended toward Jesus. Please stop. Show mercy on me. Changed his life forever. 
And you could say, well, obviously it changed his life. He was blind and now he can see. No, it changed his life even more than that. He met the Savior of the world. His life was changed forever. And I always say, every time I read about one of these miracles, I think to myself, man, I bet you that didn't stop right there for that guy. I bet he went home and he told his wife, if he had a wife or his, whoever, his mama, he walked in and said, that's a beautiful blue dress you have on today. <laughs> he let her know that he could see what she had. He, he, he was telling everybody, I can see the trees, I can see the grass, I can see your donkey, I can see whatever, I can see. He was telling the news far and wide, and I bet he didn't stop there. I bet he said, Jesus of Nazareth, help me to see. Listen, church, this is what we should be doing. Listen, it's scary, it's as hard, we got bad times, but we're also seeing great things. We should be sharing with others when good things happen. We should be spreading God's word. We should be helping people overcome fear. We should be praying for each other. There's Christians who are walking around in fear. And we see this, and then it says this, After Jesus healed him, he immediately got up and followed and started praising God. Praising God. The last thing in this was he walked along rejoicing that God had worked in his life. Are you overwhelmed by the sadness and the bad things and you forgot to praise God? Are you overwhelmed by your circumstances and wondering, Lord, am I fixing to be laid off? Am I not going to have any money? Is the stimulus coming? You're putting your faith in the wrong things. Put your faith in somebody who can make a difference. Stimulus money will last as long as stimulus money is available. God lasts forever. I'm not saying that we shouldn't trust our government. I'm not, this is not anything about government or anything else. We should pray for our government. We should pray for wisdom for our president and discernment. We should pray that them will quit fighting to each other and start helping the country and the world. But we should be praying that they will come together and lead we should be praying the ones that are Christians will affect the other ones around them. We should be praying for our leaders every day. We should be praying for our government leaders every day. This man followed Jesus and he praised God. And this starts, this starts what I want to do today. I'm going to just go and I'm going to quickly, I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to point things out to you right after this. Jesus has an encounter with Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And if you don't know this story, I don't want to assume that you know this story. I know a lot of people know this story, but if you don't, it's found in God's Word in Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 19. It starts out, verse 1, and it talks about Zacchaeus. It goes through about verse 10. And Zacchaeus had heard the same thing. He had heard that Jesus was coming to his town, and Zacchaeus was a tax collector, hated and you know the story, Zacchaeus runs ahead, he climbs a tree, and Jesus tells him, come down, Zacchaeus. He climbs a tree because the Bible said he was short, and he was trying to get a good look at Jesus. He probably was interested and wanted to know, and he, he probably just wanted to see, he just wanted to be part of it. So he climbs up a sycamore tree, and he's looking, and he sees Jesus, and Jesus walking along and seeing a, another thing about Jesus being about God's business. Jesus wasn't surprised that he encountered a beggar at the gate, Blind beggar at the gate. He's not surprised that Zacchaeus is skinnied up a tree. He knows. And he looks up and he says, Come down, Zacchaeus, for today I'm going to eat lunch at your house. And Zacchaeus comes down, and buddy, this sends off a wave. People start scoffing. These, these, these Pharisees are saying, How in the world can this man who says he is who he says he is come and eat with a sinner like this? Well, Jesus tells us all through the New Testament he didn't come for those who are well. He came for those who are sick. And he went out of his way to call this tax collector down. And what you see in this story, as Jesus is making his way, let's make a point right now. Jesus is making his way to enter Jerusalem. He is making his way to go into the city of Jerusalem to start the last week of his earthly ministry, headed every step to the cross. And Jesus knows this. Jesus is aware of this. 
Jesus fully understands what the cross represents. Jesus understands what he's going to do. Again, an example for me and you about how much Jesus Christ loves us. He knows that he's a sacrifice. He knows that he lived a sinless life. He knows he's going to the cross to die for my sins and your sins and all the sins before us and after us. He knows. He knows. And Jesus does this. He marches on. He's every step he takes. And while he's having an encounter with Zacchaeus, he knows. And Zacchaeus comes down. And he basically, the story is, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing this from memory, so he, he basically says, Lord, I know that I have done wrong. I know I have sinned against you. I know I have wronged my fellow mankind. I know I'm a tax collector. I'm crooked. I know, Lord, that I'm terrible. And God says to him, Zacchaeus, he, he, actually, he goes on and tells God, for all the things I've done, I will fix. I'll repay. See, that's a sign of repentance in Zacchaeus' life. And I want to tell you today, in this little part of Jesus' walk to enter the city, he shows us an example of somebody taking accountability, somebody taking, standing up and saying, I'm the one who's wrong, not the ones around me, and I'm going to do something about it. And he gave away, I think he said, half of what he had immediately. And then he said he'd pay back whoever he had done wrong three or four, I can't remember exactly, three or four times more. Zacchaeus repented and then he took action. It's a great example for us today. We see Jesus teaching. We see Jesus encountering the Pharisees. We see him doing all these things as he is entering. So he enters the city of Jerusalem. And if you're following along, this is still in chapter 19 of Luke, and this is about verse 28. And as he gets there, he goes and he tells his disciples to go ahead of him, bring a coat. If they ask you why, tell them the Lord needs it. They bring it back, they put the blanket on the coat, and Jesus sits on the coat's back and he starts entering into the city. And when he starts entering into the city, people start throwing their cloaks and their coats on the ground. They start waving palm branches and they're singing praises to God. Now we'll point out to you today that this same crowd, just a few days in advance here, just a few days in the future, are shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And you say, well, Lord, how, preacher, how were they worshiping the Lord and then they turned on him so quickly because they were looking for something that they thought he was going to provide and they never really saw what he really provided. And these people were wouldn't wanting a, a king to come in and push Rome out, to run Rome out and take over and set up a kingdom here on earth. And it never was God's intention. The kingdom's going to be with God in heaven. It's not going to be here. And he, he was, they never really understood. Some did. And those who truly understood wasn't hollering crucify him. It was the ones who were looking for some, something to fix them, fix their needs immediately. And he enters that city. And man, all the time headed to the cross. It just keeps coming back into my head. The whole time he was doing what he was doing, he was so willing to die for me and you. Headed to the cross. He enters the city. He goes to the temple. He takes and makes a little whip out of a strand of cord. And he runs those people that are abusing God's house out. He clears the temple and he says, you made it into, it's supposed to be a house of prayer and you made it into something else. Warning for us, a warning for us, know and be reverent about God's house. Know and be reverent about God's work. Know and be reverent about how we're supposed to act. He said, you've made it into a place where you're profiting. You made it into a place where you're stealing and he wouldn't have it. And he moves and runs them out of the temple. He is, a, he is encountered and he teaches every day that week in the temple. He encounters Jewish leaders and they question his authority. He's doing all of this again, leading, walking, and heading each day to the cross. They question his authority 
And Jesus responds to them in that way. They say that he is, they call him all kind of things. They accuse him of all kind of things. And Jesus keeps saying over and over again, I'm doing what God, my Father, has called me to do. And the last thing I want to get to today, I want to focus in on chapter 21 as we're walking. And next week, we're going to kind of pick this back up and we're going to kind of start at the Last Supper, around the Last Supper, and then in the garden, and then on to being crucified, and of course on Easter Sunday being resurrected. But on chapter 21, there's this little encounter Jesus has, and I'm just going to read these four verses to you. This is the widow's offering, chapter 21, verse 1. And Jesus looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw... A poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put, all, put in all she had to live on. Now, you know, this is read and preached a lot of times about giving. And it does refer to giving. It refers to somebody giving everything they got or the last they got and somebody giving out of the wealth that they have. It's talking about sacrificial giving. But as I read this this week, I thought about are we giving God all that we have? What part of our life are we holding back from God? Listen, it can be money. It could be money for you. It could be saying, well, in these troubled times, I'm sure not sending anything to the church. Or in these troubled times, I'm sure not giving to any charities I give. And in this troubled time, I am certainly not rolling down my window and handing somebody who says homeless and I need food. I'm certainly not sticking a dollar bill out the window to those folks. It can be that about you if money's your thing. But it also reeks, reads and speaks to us holding back our life. Jesus said she gave all that she had she gave all that she had if those last two coins to a widow were the last coins she had it could have meant life or death and you see it said Jesus was sitting down on the steps on the, and some other gospels that Jesus is sitting there and he's watching these people and they're pouring this in they're pouring out a bag of plenty that they have they're just filling these coins and making it rattle and looking around to see who's looking oh look at me I'm so good and then this little widow woman comes in with two copper, the smallest coins you could have, and drops them in the thing, drops them in the container or whatever they're collecting the money in. And Jesus witnesses this, and he says, these other folks are giving out of their abundance. She's giving out of all that she has. See, if you give all you have, you're trusting God to replenish what you have. And this speaks to every person under the sound of my voice. There is not one who could not do better about giving all they have to God. And there's probably not many who are holding something back. God, I'm going to hold on to this one little sin of flesh. I'm going to hold on to this because this is my private thing. God, I'm going to trust you in all things, but I, I, you know what? I'm not going to trust you that you could fix my marriage. I'm not going to trust you that you could stop my addictions. I'm not going to trust you in that. God, I'm going to count on heaven. I'm going to count on that. I'm going to count on you being a Savior. But man, Lord, I, you know, Jesus, I, I can't make you Lord of everything. This little verse in chapter 21 starts off from these first four verses. We see a great example of a person saying, God, this is all I got. And yes, it's money in this. It's money, but this is all I got. So when I put this in this offering plate, so let's just make it real for us like today. When I put this, I don't have any more money to buy bread. I don't have any more money to pay my power bill. I don't have any more money to do anything. But let's go one step further. Lord, if I put it out there to everybody that my faith is in Jesus Christ, I can't hide socially with my different group of friends. I can't hide socially at work behind my little cubicle. 
If I put out there that I trust and I have faith in Jesus Christ, if I stop and say, you look worried and depressed, you look scared and afraid, can I pray for you? When I put that out there, I become that person and I can't run back to my little secluded area and be who I want to be in private. See, that's giving all too. You can easily say, well, it's about money. And here's Preacher Kim preaching about money. I tell you all the time, you're not going to hear me preach about money. Because I believe again, I'm going to tell you again, I believe when your heart is right, when you have your faith in the right place and you trust the God on high in all, with all of your heart, these other things will come into line. These other things will come into line. So God, I trust you, but I don't trust you enough to reach out and help somebody when I'm not sure how I'm going to be helped and what I'm going to have left. And so, you know, you say, well, yeah, Pastor, but these are difficult times. They are difficult times. They're crazy times. And I'm not saying you do anything against what they're telling us to do. But let me tell you something. You can talk to somebody about Jesus over the interweb. You can talk to somebody about Jesus over text messages. You can talk to somebody to Jesus about over the phone. If you don't have a cell phone, then you probably got a landline. If you don't have a landline, walk out on your porch and holler at your neighbor. You can talk to Jesus six feet away with social. You can talk about Jesus six feet away and with social distancing. You can do these things. Or you can say, I'm putting everything on hold till the world gets straightened back out. Can I tell you today that this could be the start? Can I tell you today that something else could come? Can I tell you today something else probably will? If you look at the history of God's Word, if you look at the history of our country, there's always something that could stop you from being who God has called us to be. And this little widow is a great example. She gave all she had. She surrendered all she had. And Jesus' encounter with her on the way to the cross, she gave all she had. As we're closing out today, I want to read you something in John. And this is John chapter 12, verses 47 through 50. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I do not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And Jesus is doing this. He's been talking to believe, people who believe and people who don't believe. And he tells them at the end, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm doing what God commanded me to do. And he says a big thing in the beginning of that. I didn't come to judge you. I come to give you words for eternal life. I come to save you. I come to lead you to salvation. This message in John chapter 12, these verses are just as real today. So today, if you're hearing me and you don't know who Jesus Christ is, he simply says right here, I didn't come to condemn you. I didn't come to punish you or judge you. I came to give you words of grace and salvation. But he also comes with a warning. He says, but my Father who sent me is the judge. And on that given day, we're going to stand in front of him and we're going to give an account of what we've done right and what we've done wrong. And he's going to say that day, he's going to make the judgment, you're either mine or you're not. And being saved, having salvation, trusting Jesus Christ has so many benefits on this earthly, in this earthly life. You can trust him and you can have his peace. You can trust him and you can eliminate fear. He tells us he don't give us a spirit of fear. He gives us power. Power. And you can trust him. You can trust him with your life. You can put your life in his hands. 
And I heard it said this week from a pastor friend of mine who said he'd been talking to some of his older members and they said, I'm not fearful about this and I know it's hard on older folks, but if this takes me out, I will be in heaven with God. And that ain't such a bad swap off. Now listen, God has appointed us a time to live and a time to die and he wants us to be on this earth and he wants us to be about his business. And this is exactly what this verse is saying. And what I've talked to you all the way through today is Jesus, even under the stress of knowing that he was going to the cross, did not stop doing God's work. Our encouragement today, church, is be God's church when times are bad. Be God's church when times are good. And do not let fear ruin or rule your life. Do not let fear stop you. And marching toward God means we're giving up less control, our control, and more control to Him. And be like the widow. Give it all. Give it all. Live each day under God's commandment. Listen to the Holy Spirit and do what He leads you to do. We have to have social distance right now. We can't be together. Take this time and dig into God's Word. Take this time and pray about things that God has put on your heart. If you're wondering why you're here, if you're wondering what your response should be, dig into God's Word and make your prayer life more active than it's ever been. Seek and ye shall find. If you're looking for Him, you'll find Him. And make that be your habit during these times. I want to remind you of something we read last week as we close. Philippians 2.8 tells us that Jesus was obedient all the way unto death on the cross. And again today, you can know Him. Ask Him to be your Savior. Ask Him to be your Lord. Recognize your need for Him. Recognize your sin in your life and repent. And ask Him to guide your steps. Listen, it, re it reduces so much pressure. It relieves so much pressure. He knows we're going to stumble. He knows we're going to fail. Pray each day to Him and make you the man, the woman, the boy, the girl that He intends for us to be. And walk toward Him. Some Christians are standing still in the middle of the road looking left and right. They don't know what to do. Start moving toward Jesus. And if you don't know Him, I tell you every week this is the third time you can know Him today wherever you're listening to this and wherever you're hearing this message, you can say to him, Father, God in heaven, I recognize that you sent your son to die on a cross for my sins and I recognize my sins and I ask you to forgive me. And God, I'm opening up my heart to you and I want to start this journey towards you. It is as simple as that. But I'll tell you again, if you do that, Make sure you let a Christian friend know. Make sure you let your grandma who's been praying for you that's a Christian know. Let, make sure somebody knows. You can call Greenwood Baptist Church and let me or reason know. And then find you a place to go. Find you a place that preaches the Bible. Find you a place that a community of Christians love each other and are working toward what God has called us to do and get involved. And you say, well, I, I got so much I can't change it all at once. You don't have to change it all at once. You don't have to change it all at once. Let God work in your life and work through you. And he will do it. God was sent here to do his Father's will. When we accept him as our Savior, when we take that benefit of salvation, we're expected to be about the Father's business too. Do not forget how great God is. Do not forget how great his mercy is and his love is. We serve a great God. We serve a great God. Jesus is a great king. Take confidence in that today. Pray with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these examples of what Jesus Christ was doing and willing to do. I thank you for how he had full knowledge of what he was about to do in less than a week. Well, in a week's time, in Palm Sunday, Lord, he, he knew that it was drawing to an end. And he entered that city, and on that next Friday, he was crucified, God. 
Lord, we thank you so much for this provision in our life. And we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. And we thank you so much how you love us, God. God, I pray for protection today over the congregation that I, that you have put me over, Lord. I, I humbly pray for them today. God, they're your people. And they're my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I pray for protection over them and their family. I pray for the ones that have lost their jobs, God, that you'll provide for them. I pray that you'll help them find other work. God, I pray for mercy for our city and our state and our neighboring cities and neighboring states and our country in general. God, in the world, I pray that you will show us mercy and stop this virus. For God... If you choose to extend this and you choose for this to be something that goes on, God, I pray that you show us how, how to persevere, Lord. I pray that we do it in a way that honors you. God, we know that you are a worthy king. We know that you are worthy of our praise and worthy of our worship. And God, we praise you. We praise you today and we exalt you today. Lord, we love you. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins. And God, if anybody today has made a decision to follow you, God, I pray that they'll take the steps to get other people around them to help them start this journey and help them in their new walk with Christ. Lord, we know that you're working in this time. And we exalt you this morning. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Hey, my name is Reason Holt. I'm with Greenwood Baptist Church, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for um, diving into God's Word with us. Listen, I just want to offer you a little bit of encouragement. This upcoming weekend is Easter, and so we've got a couple of special things planned on Friday, which is Good Friday. At 6 p.m., we will be live streaming on Facebook. Uh, and then also on Sunday morning at 7.15 for a sunrise special time together, we will also be live streaming on Facebook. So let me encourage you to find Greenwood Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia on Facebook and just encourage you to join us. And then, of course, next Sunday at 10.45, we will be releasing uh, the pre-recorded Easter service uh, on YouTube as well. And, and that will be linked in Facebook so you can find us there as well. Listen, if something struck you today and maybe God's been speaking to you or the Holy Spirit's been been stirring in your heart don't let that just sit there you can reach out to somebody who you know maybe you have a relative who is a Christian and you've got some questions you can ask them let me encourage you to do that uh, but in addition to that if you don't have anybody or if you're just looking for somebody to reach out to you can hit us up in Facebook Messenger you can contact us at the church greenwoodgray.com has all of our contact information and we would love to talk to you, to hear your story, and to pray with you. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us in doing that. Church family, if you've been wondering in, in these times with the mandate that's currently in session, uh, how you can give, listen, you can still give with PushPay. The easiest way to do that is greenwoodgray.com and click the Give link, and it'll take you directly into there. If you are writing a check and sending that in, you can get that to us as well. We are still checking the mail. We will still be able to receive tithes and offerings and any correspondence you may have uh, via mail. So that's where we're at at this time, and I would just love uh, to pray with you. And so can we do that together now? Father, we love you and give you thanks for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you. Uh, God, this is being pre-recorded right now on a Saturday, and what a glorious day this is today. We thank you for Palm Sunday, Father, when this is being viewed. We thank you for uh, the, the week that started your ascent to the cross. And Father, your glorious resurrection. God, I ask that you would be with us, that you would give us uh, encouragement to give to one another. Help us to reach out to one another, to remind each other that we're not alone in this. Father, instill your word in our heart. May we dive into your word more deeply every day. We love you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.